We're here with Chris, Mizuno's distribution and manufacturing center. And we're going to talk a little bit about you. We get a lot of questions about you. You're a popular social media guy. Where did you grow up? Tell us a little bit about that. I know you grew up as a golfer. I did. So I grew up in Dunwoody, Georgia, which Mizuno's in Norcross. So Dunwoody's not too far away, actually. So kind of a local local kid here. So grew up in Dunwoody, um, started playing golf when I was 11 years old. And it was one of those things where it was like, hey, dad, sign me up for, uh, or he signed me up for a golf clinic pissed about it didn't want to do it but then I go and I met a couple friends there and that that just triggered the passion and I've been golfing ever since I was 11. When you were growing up as a golfer did you have aspirations of PGA Tour or were you I want to do be in golf kind of world? You know it's like with any kid you have aspirations of you want to you want to play on tour you want to be the best it, it was funny I wanted to be a baseball player forever but I'm too scrawny and tiny. One to be a golfer, too scrawny and tiny. I don't hit it far enough. It's funny when the when Major League Baseball went on strike, I guess that was was that ninety four? I think it was the ninety four strike. Yeah. That was really when I switched from baseball to golf. Cause it was like all I wanted was baseball. I used to keep score of the Braves, like, you know, old pin and pad, oh, yeah. keep and score, love doing that. But that really is when I switched to golf and it became that was my full time thing and what I love doing. Always wanted to play professionally, never even close to good enough, but it was always a passion. I just loved it. And it's funny, I always, I remember going back, this was like in high school, dad's like, get a summer job, everyone's saying that. And I knew Mizuno was down the street. I remember my friends and I actually writing a letter to Mizuno saying, do you guys need testers? Like, what can we do? Like I sent letters to Mizuno just because of the proximity. And now here we are, what, 25 years later and I'm working for Mizuno. You went to Vanderbilt. That's right. Um, clearly not a sp college sports fan, but it's not very nice. <laughs> did you go to Vanderbilt with the idea of doing this, or was it just that's the background I want, that's what I want to do? So I knew I was going to be an engineer. That was was always my passion, uh, science, math, all those things. So in Atlanta, there's Georgia Tech, and then Vanderbilt's not too far away, not as high a, of an engineering program, but a good school nonetheless and a well-rounded school. So I looked at a bunch Ex of Except in sports. Baseball, we're really good. We'll, we'll go with that, right? Women's bowling. Women's bowling's good? We're a dynasty, so in case you didn't know that. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so, but no, I, I went there and it was, I looked all around the Southeast, I actually looked at a couple schools in California as well, trying to, you know, find the right sweet spot of where's the right place to be the proper distance from home, but still close enough, but that had a good engineering program. It came down to between Vanderbilt and Georgia Tech and ultimately Nashville was just such a cool city. Absolutely yeah, loved it. Awesome. So that's, that's how I ended up in Nashville at Vandy. So loved it there. Now, right out of school, you did not jump right into this. Um, in my research, you were a substitute teacher. I was. Now, I have to know, A, what subject did you teach? Uh -huh. How long did that last? And did you like it or were you just that guy, here's your assignment and started reading the paper? I actually liked it. It was fun. So um, I did that for about six months when I, after I graduated, when I was looking for the right job. I had had a couple job offers that I didn't think were going to be the right fit. And I didn't want to jump into a career that wasn't going to be the right one. So actually, my old school, Wesleyan, was actually really nice enough to bring me back and let me substitute for a little while. It was mostly middle school, um, did a lot of history, did a couple math classes. It was funny. I actually one of our history classes, I got the syllabus for the day and it was talking about Cornelius Vanderbilt, which I was like, this is great. I can talk about this. Yeah. I, I know some history here. Um, a lot of it though, it depended on the grade. When you got up to like the late middle school, they just wanted to sit around and goof off. And I just talked about what college was like to them. So I probably wasn't the best uh, substitute teacher, but I actually yeah, really enjoyed it. Across. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And then, I, and then that lasted about six months. And that was when I was going through the interview process with Mizuno at the time. And I was fortunate enough to land a job here as a club tester. And you've been here ever since, but we can't gloss over something I've just learned about. Okay. <laughs> um, you've never eaten meat. Well, you've tasted it, right. but um, you've never eaten meat. So growing up as a child right. and you, that full vegetarian your whole life. I'm fascinated by this. <laughs> I, it threw off my whole interview. I've met the rest of your coworkers and, you know, right. they, they seem like meat eaters. 
I'm looking across the table. Well, I'm guessing he's a meat eater. <laughs> um, <laughs> he's got Southern Soul barbecue on his computer. There, there you go. <laughs> um, where did that come from, and how have you maintained that? You're living in the South. You know, the South right. is known for meat. Right. So, no, um, it was part of my family. So my mom decided to become vegetarian. I've got two older sisters who are not vegetarian. My dad is very not vegetarian. And, um, and in the time between my older sisters and myself, my mom decided to be vegetarian. So when I was born, that was kind of pushed on to me. Pushed, that might be a harsh way to put it, but it's may, may be accurate. But I was always raised as a vegetarian myself, and I actually have a little sister as well. So the two of us were yeah, we just never had any interest and never really tried it aside from the occasional like, hey, you know, 20 bucks if you take a bite of this hamburger or something like that. So easy way to earn a quick 20 as a kid. So yeah. it was pretty good. Now, so obviously no hot dog at the turn. Correct. It would be like a chopped salad or something like that. If they have that, it's great. Um, what is the one thing that when you see it, you're like, I bet that does taste really good? Meat wise? Well, yeah, real food. <laughs> I, I'm yet to see that thing so none of it looks appetizing to me so at, at 38 years old I look around I'm like yeah I, I'm used really to not nothing uh, that's that's even more fascinating but I'm not going to bore them <laughs> anymore with that now you've been here for 15 years that's right yeah can you kind of walk people progression of the different things you've done sure absolutely so it's funny I talked about you know sending in a letter saying, can I be a club tester? I actually got a job at Mizuno as the testing engineer. So that was my openings. Was that when you were thinking jobs, is that like your dream job? Well, it was awesome. It, what the, to give the full background was, you know, I graduated from school. I was substitute teaching at the time. I was looking for the right thing to do. And if you go back 15 years, Monster.com was very much a thing. It was. Super Bowl commercial. So, absolutely. So on Monster, I came across a job posting of golf club designer. Mizuno USA requires 15 years experience, master's degree in this, blah, 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 just a list of things I did not have. So I was like, you know, whatever, I'll apply anyway. So I sent in a resume and didn't hear anything for a little while. And then I actually got a call back from Masao Nagai, who he is a Japanese fellow who actually helped start Mizuno R&D in the States. He reached out to me and said, you know, you're grossly underqualified for what you just applied for, but... We're actually opening up a test center at Country Club of the South, which is in, in Johns Creek, Georgia. So with that, they're going to have a robotic golfer. They're going to you know, buy all the measuring equipment. And basically, would you be interested in applying for a position to potentially work and run that? Which was, you know, as a kid, it, it test golf clubs. What's better than designing them is actually just hitting them and testing them. So right. absolutely, that was the thing to do. So that was my foot in the door was I started that in 2004 in May. And I was a club club testing engineer for the first, I guess, by title for the first probably six years. But actually, right when I got in, they were very great to me at Mizuno, where that, they actually started training me on some of the design aspects right off the bat. So David Llewellyn, who's our right now our director of R&D, David Llewellyn was a guy who he's in the industry, he was one of the first ones using CAD to design clubs. He taught me a ton and started showing me how to do everything and how he designed clubs. Like the MP33 was the first club he designed in CAD. So I got wow. to look at that model and break it down and see what he did. So I was given my first design project in 2006. So a couple putters came to market, and then I got to work on some wedges, some fitting tools, and ultimately some irons. So from 2006 until 2017, I was doing a lot of the engineering work. So a lot of the design, working very closely with our team in Japan, working with David Llewellyn. There's a, there's a whole team of engineers. And then in 2017, October, I actually moved out of R&D into the business side just to get a more well-rounded knowledge of everything. So now I'm doing less of the fun, but a lot more of the numbers and hopefully learning learning a lot more of what goes into why clubs come to market and making sure we're bringing the right things to market. We're gonna jump backwards a little bit before we go in, right into club design. Okay. Um, you're from this area, which means Falcons fan, things like that. And I know you're, you like your sports. Can you explain why Matt Ryan is below average? Because he doesn't have an offensive line. So you're under the impression that with an offensive line, Matt Ryan would be above average. Absolutely. Okay. Especially when you got Julio Jones catching the ball. So I think Matt Ryan is very, very solid. I think he gets a bad rep just because he has no time in the pocket. But I'm a huge Falcons fan. I've been 
a Falcons fan for a long time, which has its ups and downs, mostly downs, particularly the second half of Super Bowls usually don't go very well for us. But no, I'm a, I'm a huge There was Falcon a second fan. half in that game, huh? I wish there wasn't. <laughs> so you have a choice of Vanderbilt winning a football national championship. Obviously, this is make-believe. Right. Vanderbilt winning a football national championship or the Falcons winning a Super Bowl. What are you choosing and why? That's a tough one. My wife went to Alabama. So if I, so if I tell, so yeah, so I almost could think, you know, if I take the Falcons, then I might still get an inside family uh, national championship. But no, I'd take a Vandy national championship big time because that would be unbelievable. (laughs) (laughs) It is unbelievable. Um, When you were growing up, you played a lot of golf, like you said. Now you work in the golf industry, obviously, with that comes less golf. Uh, And becoming an adult and more responsibilities. What is the one thing that golf does for you as an escape? I love being outside. I love going out. I love competing. Where you find your food. Yeah, exactly. Pick it up (laughs) off the ground. (laughs) No, no, um, to me, golf is, I'm really good at, you know, at work. It comes with all its stresses, whatever. I'm very good at when I get on the golf course, I'm on the golf course. Put my phone away, check out from everything, and just soak it up. Love the weather, love being outside. Just to me, golf is, it's the perfect sport. It's so much fun. And I still, to this day, love it as much as I did from when I first started. That's the most important thing is that the passion is still there. Now, you've worked on a lot of different clubs. What is the one, we'll start with Iron, that has your like stamp on it where you're so proud of it, everything about it. Now, obviously, what people don't realize is one person never designs a golf club. It's, it's, a, it's a team. But what is the one that just jumps out to you that's like, that one's my baby? Uh, that answer has changed over the last like year and a half. So it was always the MP62 iron was my favorite iron. It was a club that when I entered the golf industry, I kind of, I said, you know, you always build these little goals in your head. I always said, I want to work with Tiger Woods. That was, that was my goal. And then, uh, you know, that, that hasn't happened with Mizuno and who's to say it might not at some point, but who knows. But ultimately, you know, I worked on a lot of engineer, worked on a lot of engineering product, worked with a lot of tour pros. And with the MP62 working with Luke Donald, I got to see Luke Donald with a club I engineered become the number one player in the world. So that was almost like, did I want to work with the number one? Did I want to work with Tiger? What What is it? Yeah. So to me, it was like with Luke getting to number one with that golf club, that was really like a special moment to me. Like I took a lot of pride in that. And what's funny is how in the last couple of years, that was still awesome as the very first one. But then uh, something's changed a little bit over the last couple of years within Mizuno and the products that we met, the product mix we have, where the JPX line has changed. And that was something that the R&D team really pushed on the rest of the company to, can we make JPX not just game improvement clubs? Can we make JPX speak to just the design and not mean it's just for a high handicap? So the JPX 900 Tour was a club that I got to be one of the lead engineers on, and it was you know a concept that the R&D team came up with, and ultimately got to see that club go into the hands of a future number one who won three majors and just won a fourth with its replacement. So to me, that's the 900 Tour is like, it did so much more than I thought a club I could work on would do. As your career has progressed, technology has progressed, and manufacturing has progressed, material, everything about the club creation process has changed in some ways. How have you been able to follow that? And I guess follow is not really the right word. You can make super forgiving clubs in very small packages is my easy way of saying it. But how have you been able to implement that would be, you know, the question, because like you said, we're seeing forgiveness in clubs. The JPX line has evolved because of that very thing. Right. You know, Mizuno does a really good job of, you know, not just creating product, but looking towards how can we make each product better, investing in different um, different design tools, different manufacturing processes, and kind of letting the engineer, letting the product drive what it's going to cost, how we're going to sell it, who it's going to be marketed towards. So, you know, throughout the time as an engineer, 
every year I was learning a new process, whether it was some sort of sound analysis, some sort of durability analysis, something that was built into the design process that allowed you to push the limits a step further than you did the year before. And on top of that, we work very closely with our some of our key vendors, some of which are pretty much exclusive Mizuno vendors. And from there to work hand in hand with, I'll talk Chuo Koyo, our, our forging foundry, as a perfect example, by working closely with that forging foundry to say, here's the limitations of forgings, here's what we can't do, how can we fix that? It's cool just to be able to have the engineer on a one-on-one -on -one talk with the guy who's you know, building the tooling, doing the forging, working on it, not just from the ideation part, but also the creation part. So what Mizuno does a great job of is, you know, we're always growing in our knowledge. So to be able to work with the, work with the foundries to get better processes, more efficient processes, and ones that push boundaries even further is something that's allowed us to continue to push the limits on everything. And it's funny, clubs got bigger and bigger and bigger, and now you're seeing them getting smaller and smaller, but doing more and more. And that comes from materials, that comes from processes, that comes from understanding the strains and the stresses put on a club, it comes from understanding the COR, the sin or gravity, all the different things about it. Can you talk a little bit about the creation process from beginning to end? For Everybody's got their own little way of going about it. CAD has changed that dramatically. And, you know, we hear from everybody that we talk to that it's the biggest change, maybe other than the solid core golf ball in, in, in creation. Can you talk about your process and what you go through from when you have this idea to what it comes out? Yeah, it's it's a long process that's, you know, it's typically over the span of a, almost a couple of years, maybe just shy of that to get to launch. And what we do is it'll all start with a product direction. I mean, the direction is, it's not, hey, we need it to look like this, we need it to do this. It's basically, here's some competitors, here's a, a part of the market that we'd like to go after. And then as a lot of it's left in the engineer's hands to make that happen, which is pretty cool because it allows the engineers to say, well, here's what we have to play with and here's the perfect recipe of what we can do. So our process looks like you know, putting together a roadmap of who we're trying to compete against, what we think is possible. If it's a replacement club, you know, what do we think we could do better from the previous version? If it's a new kind of category of a club, it's what's that hole in the market and how can we attack that? So from there, it starts with discussions with the vendors as well as discussions with our design team as well. By design team, I'm talking more like graphic design and our, you know, sketching stuff out. And I remember like on the 919 product, Myself, David, and Nobu Sakamoto, who's one of our uh, designers from Japan, literally sat down with a, basically a hand sketch of the JPX 900 line. And we just went through, how can we make this better? Where can we take mass? Where do we, can we put mass? What will it do if we put some more here? What can we do if we put some more here? And he's very good at, I mean, he can almost just draws everything by hand, wow. looks really nice. And like he can put together just a drawing that just, in theory is, well, if we could pull a little mass from here and put it here, here's what that might look like. And from there in the 3D world, we can quickly mock that up, which is cool. So it goes from a sketch to then a design. Those rough designs, we then, you know, we'll do a couple of different center of gravity tweaks or moment of inertia tweaks, or even sound tweaks where we will look at how it vibrates. We'll test those with the tour and then go back and just make the next iterations. So we'll usually start with, you know, three versions that we'll take to the tour and let those guys hit and get their feedback. Those three will turn into what's the next two, what's the next one. And from there, you you end up fine tuning further and further but like you said earlier there's a whole team involved in each of these steps yeah one of the questions i've always wanted to ask mizuno is it's all about forgings but you do make cast clubs now that you're on the marketing side mm -hmm. do you find it hard to tell that story when for so many years it's you have to play a forging grain flow forged and now all of a sudden, oh, by the way, we make these cast clubs and they're pretty good too. What's funny and what will surprise a lot of people is this year in 2019, we're going to sell more cast golf clubs than we are forged golf clubs, which will surprise a lot of people That's about Mizuno. Surprising me right now. So the whole thing is it's, you don't want to put your marketing hat on and say how it's spun, but it's, it's how it's communicated. Our forgings are leaps and bounds to, in my opinion, better than the industry because of what we do, because of how we control the grains, because of how we design them in terms of the weight placement, what we can do and what we do on the post-processing after the fact, after they're milled out of one piece. 
on the cast side, we're not just casting, you know, 17.4, or we're not just casting, you know, very basic materials. We're looking at higher strength, higher performance materials that we can get some of the benefits of a forging out of. For example, our hot metal and hot metal pro use what we call our chromoly 4140M. 4140. That's a lot of words. It's a lot of words. You're right. But what it does is cool because, you know, the typical drawbacks of casting, um, they're a little bit harder. They don't vibrate as true or as consistent because it's a poured, you know, poured liquid into a mold. They get a little bit firmer and, you, you know, you could break them if you, they get brittle when you try to bend them. Chromoly is really cool because it allows you to go very, very thin on the face. It has all the strength of a you know high high strength steel, but at the same time, it's more malleable. So by selectively heat treating certain areas, we can strengthen up parts and weaken parts, so we can actually bend it and custom fit it. So while you're not going to have the actual like grain uh, vibration that you'll get from a forging you're going to get benefits on the performance side in terms of you can go thinner, you can get higher COR, you can move more weight around. So it really is what you're looking for. And that's where you look at within our line, we've got the Hot Metal Pro and we've got the 919 Forged, which are two golf clubs that on paper look like they're going after the same person because they both fit in the very similar part of the market. But the forging is for the guy who wants that feel and realizes that feel comes at the expense of a little bit of performance. And the Hot Metal Pro is for the guy who wants distance and as a result of that distance, you're going to lose a little bit of feel. Engineering is give and take with everything. So there's there's those little tugs in each direction from those. This may sound like an off the wall question, but what would you say is the number one word used to describe your feel throughout the internet? As silly of a word as it is, it's like buttery. Yeah, that was where I thought you would say what yeah. butter is cast. Yes, that's true. <laughs> you don't think of it like that, but you're right. I mean, the, the, yeah, you got me a little bit there. <laughs> I, I, I've, I've wanted to know that for the longest time. Like, where did the buttery thing come from? Because smooth. butter is cast. Because it's smooth. So is mayonnaise, but nobody would use that. Yeah, but that's kind of gross too, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think the whole thing comes from is just the softness of it. You know, you don't want, it's not like hard, you know, straight out of the fridge butter. That is the worst when you go to a restaurant and yeah. you get it. Yeah, that's, that's bad. It's melted butter where it's creamy and smooth. And that's the feel you want from your golf club is we like to say it feels like the club sticks on the face longer. It doesn't, but you feel more because of the grain flow forging, because of the vibration. The duration of the vibration is longer. You feel more, so it feels like the ball's on the face longer, but it's not. How that exactly relates to butter, I'm not exactly sure. Let me get back. You're going to have to get back to me on that one. So that's, this leads back to a, a follow-up question that's not about you know dairy products. That's my wheel. <laughs> it's one of the food groups I can speak knowledgeably about. This is getting awkward. <laughs> um, when you are doing testing, and I know sound is a big thing here, if you remove the sound element, wear headphones, whatever it is, how much feel is altered in that? That's, that's a great question because if you remove the sound bit, element... A bit better follow-up to the casting of butter, right? <laughs> a lot is removed. And you, you hate to give so much credit to sound, but sound is feel. And there are a lot of things that go into that sound. That sound go, comes into play from the material that's used. The geometry of the head is going to dictate the uh, actual frequencies of vibration. The, the process used, whether it's forged versus cast, grain flow forged versus normal forged, is going to dictate the duration of that vibration. There's a lot of different things that go into it, but ultimately it's an audio perception that's going to lead to what you feel. When you were choosing the the final piece, you know, obviously you get tour player feedback and player testing feedback. How much of a role do you think sound plays in that to the final product that actually hits stores? It's a ton. If it doesn't sound right, it's out. And that's one of the reasons, you know, one of you'll see our hashtag, nothing feels like a Mizuno. We put that as you guys should get a shorter one, too. It's great, though. <laughs> it eats up all your characters, right? No, it's a good one just because I think people have latched onto it because it's it's something that you can perceive. Like, it's not just a hashtag that doesn't mean anything. It's a, if you're one of those guys who can feel the difference, 
you're one of our guys. You know, that's who we're speaking to. So it's something that we take very seriously. And that's from all levels from, you know, whether it's a cast wedge, a cast driver, a forged iron, a cast iron, it doesn't matter. We put a lot of emphasis onto the feel as well. So even our game improvement irons, our most game improvement, the hot metal, if you look underneath the, um, under the lip of the, of the cavity up top, you can see sound ribs there. And each one of those is to dial in a specific frequency for a feel. So we put, it, we put har what we call our harmonic impact technology into everything we do to make sure feels a big part of it. Currently, and I, I say currently, we'll say the last 10 years, uh, new technology is allowed for hollow body irons. And that has a lot of benefits in a world where distance is king. Whether or not distance is king, debatable. People might want to talk, make the argument that precision is more important. But when it comes to, I listen, me, I want distance with my irons. Right. How does an iron like that, that kind of technology, change everything? It's hard to forge. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could forge pieces, obviously. Right. Um, but you can allow for a thinner face and things like that. When you're designing, is that something that you're interested in? Is that something, I, listen, hollow body's not for me, that kind of thing. Give us your take on it. So hollow body is something, it's, it's by no means new to the industry, right. but it's funny how, how everything is so cyclical. And, you know, it comes back to a blade-like look. And if you look at us, we've done hollow body irons for a number of years. We don't actually have any in our line right this second, but that's not to say there won't be some coming and there haven't been some in the past. It's funny how with a hollow body iron, we used to, we had some like our JPX, or sorry, our MX-1000, uh, our mm -hmm. MX-900. That, that, that's actually, the MX-1000 was the one in my head. It was a great golf club. And it's so funny how on that, there's there's all this perception of, of a consumer of when I look at a golf club, does it look forgiving or not? And to different people, that could mean different things. With the J MX-1000, it actually has almost a cavity built into a hollow body golf club just because the look of a cavity to some people means more forgiving, even though technically on a hollow body iron, what a cavity is doing is pushing the center of gravity closer to the face. Right, the yeah, I mean, it, the cavity would be perimeter weighting and in their head, that's right. what matters. Exactly, but even though it's doing the opposite of helping you on that type club. So it's something that it, it allows you to do a lot of cool things on the internal structure. It's a more expensive way to make it because you have to use multiple pieces. There has to be welding and you have to make sure that, you know, all those pieces are going to fit in properly and that you're getting the right thing out of it. But a hollow body iron uh, feels a lot easier to make on a hollow body iron just because the open cavity actually changes frequencies a lot. So it takes away some of the um, negative feel of some of the harsh feeling clubs in the past. But the benefit is, you know, you can get a deeper center of gravity, which is good for some people, not great for some people. It definitely opens up some more, um, some more levers to pull in terms of what you can do on the internals. But at the same time, there's always give and take on everything. So typically a hollow body iron is gonna be a thinner faced iron. Thinner faced iron is gonna be, yes, distance, which is great for some, not great for some. So it all depends on what you're going for. But ultimately having that as another lever to pull of I can make this hollow, that's a great thing for an engineer. Yeah. Talking about innovation, in my research, I learned that I, I knew some of it, but you guys were first with a lot of things, and most of which isn't really known. I mean, a lot of people talk the sliding weight. Yes, you guys were first there. But am I correct? You guys were the first with a titanium metalwood? That's right. Why is that not known, and why is somebody else giving credit? Is it because it was here? Uh, so... I'm not exactly sure why it's not known. We're not. We've never been the best marketing company. We're not gonna. We're not. Wait, gonna, but that's your job now. So I'm not very. Good at <laughs> <my job>. No, <laughs> that's okay. No. Um, the biggest thing is, you know, we have always been a company of engineers. You know, I talked about it before, where the engineers get to drive the direction of a lot of things. So we were the first with uh, with titanium uh, titanium drivers, first with composite crown. First with like first graphite shaft plate on tour. First of a lot of different things. Not composite in the metal woods until again recently though, right? Right. We went away from it for a little bit just because manufacturing got to where you could go so thin that, that you didn't really see a benefit. And then all of a sudden manufacturing gets better on this way. So it's constantly evolving. We have done a lot of firsts, even particularly on the wood side that a lot of people don't realize. We wish more people knew it. And that's why if you saw our booth at the PGA show, we actually had some of these are the industry firsts that it's funny. You look around and you see these copied by 
copy is a harsh word, but re-engineered by so many other companies that Mizuno did first. I wanted to talk a little bit about Tor, mm -hmm. and your Tor usage has gone up quite a bit, and I know you're not free to be able to talk about a lot of the players, right. but you do have some sponsored players. First, how do you guys decide who to sponsor? Because most of the guys who come to Mizuno stay there for a long period of time. And that's just it. We're not a company who's, you know, end of the year, these guys' contracts are up, who should we go with? Most people who are Mizuno Iron players or Mizuno players on tour have a history with Mizuno. We want players who want to be with us. We don't want players who are looking for the next contract, the next paycheck. So a lot of that is we involve them very heavily on the testing side up front. You know, before there's any, you know, tour player signed, R&D goes to them, works with them on the clubs, understands what they're looking for, if our clubs are the right fit for them. The last thing you want is to sign somebody and then he comes back and says, oh, I'm struggling with my irons, I'm gonna go do this and this. We wanna make sure it's someone who wants to work with us and speaks our same language. So we always, you know, almost vet all of our players and make sure they're gonna they're the right ones for us so we don't have the biggest staff on the planet and that's part of it is that we're very very selective with who we choose but we're fortunate enough that a lot of people choose us and will play our clubs because they believe in the performance now you have to be a little more coded with the things you say i don't but i will be for the, the purpose of this interview since you're in it and we're in your building um Nike leaving the hard goods market obviously was a was beneficial to Mizuno and other companies. Right. Um, not in the aspect that they made incredible equipment or there's talented people who, uh, they, that's not what, what I'm speaking to. I'm speaking to those players then had the ability to look for other equipment. Right. A large percentage of those came here mm -hmm. and came here, and I shouldn't say came here, chose your clubs right. with no compensation. And I just wanted to, ask number one is there absolutely no compensation meaning no tee up money no nothing and how are you at working with them or your tour reps at working with them weekly to make sure they have the right thing if they need something tweaked is there somebody there who can do that or is it really a hands-off kind of thing so that was really long-winded by the okay. way I, I think i got it all okay absolutely no compensation um you know we we joke that I feel bad. There are so many good engineers and good people at Nike Golf for a while. Like I, you know, I know a couple of them, and you know, unfortunately, a lot of people you know, lost their jobs or found them elsewhere. But what that did for the golf industry was, you know, Mizuno was the top plate iron on tour for I think it was 15 straight years or something like that, um, until tee up money became a thing. And then early 90s, early late 90s. 90s. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then we always pounded our chest and said, when people didn't play, didn't pay, they chose Mizuno. That's something that you can say for so long, but that had never, it's like you're talking about something that happened 20 years ago. Is that still the case? There had never been a true test of that because the PGA Tour wasn't open to that test because people were getting paid. Nike exiting showed gave the players a chance to say, all right, well, I'm, they're honoring this contract. I can play whatever I want. And the fact that an overwhelming majority came to us shows that that was still the case, that a lot of players would choose ours if, if given the choice. Something we believe in, we thought would be the case, but obviously we didn't know. It's been awesome. How we've worked with individual players varies dramatically from one to the next. Um, we've had some guys who literally will come up and say, you know, I'm, I'm open now, build me a set of this and this, and then we never hear from them again. They may show up. We've had some that, you know, disappear into the sunlight and show up with our competitors. We've had others that showed up with ours and won some majors. So we've had some really cool things. Yeah, a, a few majors. Just a few. So that's really cool. But then we have other players who, you know, going back in time, were Mizuno players or have some sort of connection to Mizuno. For example, Luke's old caddy is on the bag of a player right now who came over and basically, you know, wanted to try them and that's been a you know a foot in the door you know golf's all about connections too you know, there's a lot of that going on and we've got a lot of good connections and you know some of those players we work whenever they want us to if he asked us to fly somewhere and work with them for some clubs by all means we'll do that so you know it, it varies greatly from one player to the next but 
our whole thing is we've got a van out that, that follows the tour around. We've got Jeff Cook and Kyle Hammond out there who are the best out on tour, and they're willing to work with anybody who wants to try our stuff. So, you know, if a player needs something, whether, whether they're getting paid by someone else or not, they'll work with them. I have two questions. One is in kind of following up on that, and one has nothing to do with anything really, as usual. <laughs> we, we talked, you were very specific about irons. And I know Mizuno is considered an iron company. But you did have a win with Metal Woods this year. Right. I should say, he has no idea what I'm going to ask in any of these. We've gone over <laughs> nothing. So just know this isn't scripted at all. Um, you did have a win with Metal Woods. Will we start seeing... There was a time when you had a lot of Metal Woods. You had... I, I'm going off memory, so if I'm totally wrong, just correct me. I'll edit it. Don't worry. They won't, <laughs> they'll never know. Um, VJ won with a driver, a Mizuno driver, I believe. Yes. And that was actually the last Mizuno driver to win on the PGA Tour. And that until? Until this year. So it had been 19 years since we had had a Mizuno driver win on tour. A lot of that came from how we acted. You know, from, from our side as a company, we were happy to sign players to 10, 11 club deals, let you play whatever driver you want, just do what we do. Um, now we're changing that attitude a little bit, and you've seen it a little bit. Keith Mitchell, who won with our driver, actually is not contracted to play it. Part of our contract is actually pretty cool where, you know, going forward, some of that could change. We could have some people contracted to play it. But Keith, to use him, for example, he is not contracted to right now. So part of the contract is written where we're, each player gets testing days with us. And that goes back to what I said of we want to make sure R&D is in the face of the players working with them. So with Keith, we want to do some testing and we want to do some driver testing. He was playing a TaylorMade M1, been playing it for years, said that's the best part of his game, had no intention to change, basically walked up and we were testing some prototypes and it just beat what he hit. So he put it into play because it outperformed. And that's part, kind of what we like to do is we like to say, here are the clubs, test them. If they work, they work. So, you know, in terms of our Metalwood promotion on tour, you've seen more drivers in play this year than since probably 2000 and we expect that to continue that's in part because of how we're interacting with our players but it's also in part because the product's getting better and better and better so you know you can't just pay people and just say go play it because then you'll have there's some other companies who try that and it doesn't always go well but we want to work with the players and make sure we're comfortable on both ends of what we're, what the expectations are from each other Finally, and I'm asking this question because it'll be in the top five comments we get if I don't ask it, the shirt. You're wearing a Mizuno shirt, and people are going to ask where they can buy it, if they can buy right. it. It's funny. I, um, I couldn't decide whether to wear a Mizuno shirt or not for this. The fact that I had one, I was like, I'm going to wear this. This actually came from – I got this from Canada. Chris Caldwell, our rep up in Canada, got this to me. So the answer is no, they can't have that. Right now, no. Um, in the States right now, we don't sell any of the apparel. In Europe, we do. In Japan, we do. Actually, in Canada, we do. So, again, not to say that won't – It's like they hate America. <laughs> Obviously not. That's said in jest. I should say that. <laughs> we like making money. <laughs> we, we like to understand where our, where our focuses need to be. So it's a great shirt. It's just very comfortable. I like it. So uh, for, all, it. for all those Canadians watching, please go grab one. Call Chris Caldwell up. He'll hook you up. So Should we have his number? Go absolutely. We'll, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for the time. Absolutely. We'll have more coming from Mizuno. But uh, thank you for diving in deep to cast as butter as cast and everything else. Absolutely.